started here just in the interest of time. We've got an hour plan for this. Um, so I want to thank everyone for joining us. This is our second uh, meeting of the Policy and Workforce Development Working Group. Um, as we get started, I just want to go through a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, of course, we ask that all participants please mute yourselves when not speaking. Uh, this will also help with you know, preventing feedback or echo. Uh, please feel free to enter any comments in the chat box or raise your hand to ask questions, but we do prefer comments to be made out loud in order to make sure we capture everything correctly in the meeting minutes. Um, and when you are speaking, uh, please do identify yourself so we have that for the record. And a reminder that this meeting is being recorded and the recordings and minutes will be posted online. And so we can go ahead and just walk through the agenda now. Um, you know, we, I want to start off and give everyone a chance to introduce themselves, and then we'll review the working group charter and our guiding principles. And then my colleague Jennifer Gorman will provide an overview of current Connecticut policies related to hydrogen and guide us through uh, trends and best practices and you know what we're seeing in other jurisdictions. Uh, the second half of the meeting, um, we'd like to focus our attention to workforce development issues. Uh, we're very excited to be joined by uh, folks from labor to speak here. Uh, we've got Keith Brothers and Joe Toner, as well as uh, Aziz Dekan from the Connecticut Roundtable on Climate and Jobs. Uh, again, very excited to have them joining us uh, and participating here. Um, and then right at the end, we'll wrap up with uh, you know, a little bit of discussion and hopefully some, some talk about next steps. Uh, just a brief reminder on Stratagen's role here. Uh, we are handling meeting facilitation, planning, logistics, meeting minutes, um, along with recordings, uh, which as I said, will be made publicly available. Uh, and we also provide technical assistance and research uh, to support this working group. So uh, as we get started here, uh, I'd like to ask everyone to please share your name uh, title and your organization. Uh, I can kick us off here um, and then we'll just I'll kind of prompt everyone going through the list here. Um, I'm Joe Goodenberry, uh, Senior Manager with uh, Strategy and Consulting. Uh, I'll pass it to my, my colleague Jennifer. Good morning everyone, I'm Jennifer Gorman. I'm an analyst with Strategy and Consulting. And then I think Sarah Harari from Connecticut Green Bank. Good morning, uh, Sarah Harari, Connecticut Green Bank, Associate Director of Innovation, Senior Advisor to the President. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and so I'll just kind of go through the list here. I apologize, you're not grouped by organization, at least in my in my list. So we'll skip around a little bit. But uh, Alex Judd. Hey, good morning, I'm Alex Judd from Dave Pitney Partner at Dave Pitney. We're the law firm supporting uh, the Green Bank uh, on these efforts. Good morning, uh, Eric. Good morning or good afternoon now, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Annis. Uh, I work in the uh, Office of Supply within BETP within Connecticut Deep. It's a lot of acronyms. Um, so uh, we work on all these issues. So I'm looking forward to working with everyone as one of the commissioner's representatives um, on this uh, group. So thank you. Thanks, sir. Uh, Aziz? Aziz Dekhan, Executive Director, Connecticut Roundtable on Climate and Jobs. George. Good morning, uh, George Bradner. I'm with the Connecticut Insurance Department. I'm the Assistant Deputy Commissioner and Director of the Property Casualty Division. Great, uh, Julia. Good afternoon, everyone. Julia Domain, Supervisor of Strategy and Operations for the Connecticut Public Utilities Regulatory Authority. Uh, Alex, Alex Isaac. Good afternoon, everyone. Alexandria Isaac from Fuel Cell Energy Senior Counsel. Uh, I think Kai from Stratagen is on as well now. Hi, Kai here. I'm a, an analyst at Stratagen. Uh, Keith, you and Joe? Yeah, Keith Brothers, president of the Connecticut State Building Trades, representing 30,000 union construction workers and their families across the state of Connecticut. Hello all, I'm Joe Tone. I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut State Building Trades Council. Uh, Nathan? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Oh, there I am, okay. Uh, yeah, Nathan Froling, Director of External Affairs for the Nature Conservancy. I also oversee our climate and energy uh, program. Good to uh, be here. Lydia? Hi everybody, Lydia Rupert, uh, Research Analyst with the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection of Connecticut. Samantha? Hi all, I'm Sam Janowski, she, her, the State Director of Sierra Club's Connecticut Chapter. Shannon? 
Hi, everyone. I'm Shannon Lawn. I am an attorney and the Connecticut State Director for Conservation Law Foundation. Sophia. Hey, everyone. Sophia Browning. I'm an associate with Dave Pitney. I'm working with Alex Judd to support the Green Bank on this initiative. Sweetheart. Hi, uh, I'm Sridhar Kanuri from uh, Hi Axiom. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for the organization. Becca? Hi, all. Becca Treach, Senior Policy Advisor at Connecticut Deep. Great. Uh, thanks, everyone. Is there anyone I missed? I don't. doesn't look like we have anyone on the phone either, so uh, hopefully we got through everybody, and sorry if that was uh, just a little bit tedious, but um, it's great to hear from you all, and I'm glad we have such a great turnout. All right, so um, for those that are new uh, to participation in this work group or who may have missed our first uh, meeting, just a brief refresh on objectives here. Um, you know, our aim is to review the Connecticut policy and regulatory landscape to understand potential gaps uh, or areas of further need that should be addressed to promote development of clean hydrogen in Connecticut. Um, this working group will also provide recommendations on workforce initiatives and policy developments based on best practices that can help support a clean hydrogen ecosystem in a state. Uh, run through the key deliverables. Uh, first is a set of policy principles to help guide stakeholders and other working groups to align their research and recommendations with existing policy or policy trajectory on clean hydrogen. Uh, also, a hydrogen policy readiness assessment to identify the current status of hydrogen policy regulation and oversight in Connecticut. And of course, throughout, we'll be coordinating with other working group efforts uh, that may impact expected uh, clean hydrogen policy recommendations or developments. And we'll conduct a best practices assessment, uh, potentially flagging specific policy initiatives that you know, might be most relevant for Connecticut's regulatory framework. And this working group will also provide an assessment of uh, clean hydrogen job creation opportunities, uh, specific opportunities, Connecticut, and best practices for workforce development and workforce transition. And so uh, just want to very briefly review our first deliverable uh, set of policy guiding principles. Uh, we shared this at our first working group meeting in September, as well as at the October task force meeting earlier this month. So we're not going to focus much of our discussion today on this at all, but uh, did, did want to quickly walk through. Uh, this is intended really as a set of uh, policy guardrails that as the other working groups and the activities of the task force uh, as recommendations are being made here, uh, we want to make sure they're in alignment um, from a policy standpoint. So we asked that all final recommendations from working groups uh, be in compliance with relevant state statutes or regulations um, or identify any changes that would uh, be necessary to enable compliance. Um, we do have a question here, so uh, Nathan, go ahead. I think I see a hand raise. Yes, yeah, sorry, that was a mistake. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe later. To, sorry about that yeah. distraction. That's okay. It's good to know uh, the functionality is working correctly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we also ask that all recommendations align with state policy and active regulatory proceedings uh, and identify any fundamental underlying policy or regulatory challenges, uh, as well as potential enablers, uh, identify expected impacts to active policy proceedings and identify or recommend relevant regulatory uh, stakeholder proceedings that could be used to allow for additional review and vetting or identify the need for new procedural avenues. And at our last working group meeting uh, in September, we discussed the importance of presenting a baseline of where Connecticut currently stands with regard to programs and policies relevant to clean hydrogen. Uh, and this is to inform that readiness assessment that I talked through uh, in our deliverables, but. Uh, you know, the, the working group has put together uh, a list of some of the key pieces here in coordination with the folks at Dave Pitney. Uh, so I'll, I'll hand it off to my colleague Jennifer Gorman, uh, who will lead us through that discussion, as well as the clean hydrogen best practices that we're starting to see in other jurisdictions. So take it away, Jen. All right. Thank you, Joe. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jennifer from Stratagen, and I'm very excited to be here to talk a bit about existing Connecticut hydrogen policy and a big thank you to Dave Pitney for helping us put together that research. And then we'll work to understand how other states in the nation have addressed the need for hydrogen related policy. 
So first of all, we've seen that Connecticut does have very strong decarbonization policy, which provides very important ecosystem support for the development of clean hydrogen to contribute to these goals. Connecticut General Statute 22A 200A requires specific levels of greenhouse gas emissions across the state, while Public Act 22 5 requires reductions specific to the electric sector. So that does require that a 100% zero emissions electric supply is achieved by 2040. This is supported by Connecticut's RPS or Renewable Portfolio Standard, which sets targets for renewable resource generation by electric generators. Additionally, another important piece related to hydrogen, Connecticut also has NOx emissions limits for stationary fuel burning sources, and Connecticut is also part of the multi-state medium and heavy duty zero emissions vehicle MOU. Looking at Connecticut hydrogen specific legislation, we've seen a few pieces, but of course this is limited as it is in all states across the country, but we'll provide a summary of the legislation that we have been able to identify. Of course, in most recent memory, Special Act 22-8 established the Hydrogen Power Study Task Force, which is why we're all here. And additionally, in 2022, Connecticut General Statute 31-53D established that a developer of a two megawatt or greater project needs to take all reasonable actions to ensure that a community benefit agreement is entered into and ensure that appropriate actions to ensure a workforce development program is established in an impacted area. This legislation is very unique to Connecticut and is very important when we're looking at community impacts associated with hydrogen. Additionally, Connecticut General Statute 16-244 and Connecticut General Statute 16A-3 are related to fuel cells and they set competitive processes for EDC procurement and they note that the deep commissioner may solicit proposals for class one resources to meet EDC load respectively. Additionally, as I already mentioned on the last slide, Connecticut is part of the multi-state medium and heavy duty ZEV MOU, and this sets goals to achieve 30% ZEVs by 2030 and 100% by 2050. In support of this, Connecticut has also directed the development of a zero emissions bus implementation plan. Finally, regarding in-state resource planning, which can also support the development of clean hydrogen, Executive Order 21-3 directed DEEP to include in their current comprehensive energy strategy a set of strategies to provide for more affordable heating and cooling, achieve reductions in GHG emissions from residential buildings and industrial facilities, and also improve the resilience of the state's energy sector. And of course, all of these recommendations may include hydrogen, but that's still to be determined because the process is undergoing currently. Further, the 2020 state IRP discussed hydrogen as a strategy to reduce in-state emissions. Day Pitney has also put together a list of relevant definitions that apply to Connecticut statutes that may be relevant to hydrogen. For example, these definitions include the definition of an environmental justice community or of a critical facility. But to spare everyone, I won't be reading those out today, but we do have a resource if anyone is interested. Additionally, I just wanted to note that Stratagen has looked into Connecticut um, funding policy and programs that are related to hydrogen. Um, this topic is going to be discussed in depth in the funding working group on Wednesday, October 26th. So I won't be going through these today, but I did just want to flash it up for everyone's awareness that we have looked into this. All right, I know that was a bit of an information dump, but with all of that top of mind, we wanted to pose the following questions for working group participants. First of all, and I can flash back to that slide, but we wanted to know if anyone had any policies that were top of mind that were potentially missing from this hydrogen specific policy list in Connecticut. Shannon, yep. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to flag that the Connecticut Department of Transportation is in the process of finalizing the state's freight plan. Um, so I think that's worth including here for heavy duty transportation. 
That's incredibly helpful. Thank you for flagging that, Shannon. Um, also, we very much welcome feedback over email. Um, these slides have been circulated and they will also be posted on the Green Bank's website. So um, at the end of the presentation, we'll flash up Joe's email. So if anything comes to mind after the meeting, um, feel free to send that over. I think moving on, I think we can pose to stakeholders. Understanding the policies that we presented that Connecticut has related to hydrogen currently in place, um, have stakeholders identified any gaps or areas for development for further policy development that can encourage the development of a clean hydrogen ecosystem? Samantha, yep. Yeah. Um Thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, I think when, you know, as you reviewed kind of what our role here is in the working group, it, um, it sort of laid out looking at what policies we have in place and what are um, the gaps, but didn't lay out, you know, do, do we want to recommend a policy framework um, that, that would, um, encourage, you know, green hydrogen in, in the trajectory we're going here and talking about where we want to be. Um, so I just want to lay that out as something we might want to uh, think about. Um, but I do think that um, one area that um, we don't have good policy on and really is um, important in terms of understanding the greenhouse gas um, indirect and direct greenhouse gas emissions um, from hydrogen is a good downstream hydrogen leakage um, policy. Yeah. And so I think that's something we should just uh, name uh, that's an area of great concern that we don't have a good policy on. No, absolutely. That's definitely um, an emerging area of concern in terms of hydrogen. So that's a great flag for something to look into. I think I also see a hand up from Aziz. Yeah, thank you. So um, I want to echo what Sam just said. Um, we're concerned the roundtable has some concerns about how we define green hydrogen, um, and we want to make sure that the uh, renewable um, designation um, is we, is carefully put onto this. Um, and we also want to make sure that, and we I know we're going to talk about this in the next uh, half hour that um, the jobs that we're creating are in, in the form of renewable jobs and green renewable jobs at that. Mm -hmm. And when you're thinking about um, renewable jobs, are you thinking in terms of, you know, renewable energy or like sustainable jobs in the long term? I, I think it's a combination of both, actually. Um, and we and, and in particular, though, we, I, we would be hard pressed to support um, some, you know, jobs that were not renewable in a renewable energy source yeah and i'm not sure that the designation currently is that so we need we need to create create some policy framework as sam just announced absolutely yeah both of those comments are great feedback much appreciated alex isaac Hi, everyone. Um, just to echo some of the comments that have already been given, I think it's important that as we look to define or have a set of definitions that are going to instruct not only these policies, but several others, um, you know, I would be, uh, you know, remiss if I didn't say that I feel like the national and global conversation is moving away from the color wheel designation of of hydrogen and talking more in the framework of carbon intensity um, when talking about the sources that are that are making the hydrogen. Uh, I think this will allow, if Connecticut builds its framework of definitions in this way, um, I think it, it allows our ecosystem, if you will, our hydrogen ecosystem to 
uh, blend well with um, our neighboring states and, uh, and the conversation happening around the country, as opposed to having Connecticut develop its definition of green that may not fit exactly into maybe what our neighboring states are using as its definition of green. So again, getting away from the color, color wheel and talking more about carbon intensity where it could be measured uh, exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, and seeing the direction that we're moving in with the hydrogen definition, um, that's actually what we have teed up next for conversation. So if we don't have any further comments, I might just move into that. So up next, I'll be providing an overview of hydrogen related policy that we've seen passed across the nation so we can really understand how other states have been tackling the sometimes complicated issue of developing a hydrogen ecosystem. So across the nation, as the topic of hydrogen development has been emerging, we've been seeing clear concerns that have been developing in response. These topics include hydrogen safety, infrastructure, workforce impacts, public health impacts, conversations about emissions such as NOx, and conversations regarding the appropriate use of hydrogen and who's even deciding this. So states have implemented policies in response to some of these concerns. In response to these conversations, we've been seeing an ever increasing amount of policy um, passed related to hydrogen and a lot specifically related to clean hydrogen. So in the past three years, hydrogen specific legislation has absolutely skyrocketed across the nation. We've seen about 120 hydrogen related bills that have been passed, of which a third explicitly apply to clean, green, renewable hydrogen. In general, hydrogen related bills have been focused on a particular end use, such as mobility, industry, or the gas and electric sector, of which mobility is by far the most common hydrogen related bill subject that we've seen. Additionally, a smaller set of hydrogen related bills provides specific grant funding, authorized studies or working groups such as this one, or address safety provisions related to the storage or transport of hydrogen. Further, a hot topic that I think everyone's very interested in, relating to the definition of clean hydrogen, we've seen that states and countries are defining clean hydrogen eligibility in pretty similar ways. Increasingly, and based on federal guidance, we've seen definitions based on a carbon intensity range, specifically based on a life cycle carbon intensity range. But there are also definitions that we see across the country that incorporate additional specification, which has focused on the allowable feedstock type. For example, a definition may include that a clean hydrogen production source may be renewable or it may specify that the production source has to be non-fossil fuel. We'll be spending the next few minutes to further understand how other states and countries have defined clean hydrogen and discussing how this might apply to Connecticut. So federal guidance from the proposed clean hydrogen production standard, which Alex just mentioned, has established clean hydrogen as that with less than four kilograms of CO2 emitted per kilogram of hydrogen produced on a life cycle basis, which is defined as a well to gate basis. The use of this life cycle based definition of clean hydrogen removes ambiguity with the colors of hydrogen. So we've increasingly seen definitions move away from defining hydrogen as quote, green or blue or pink. And this provides a standardized methodology to assess hydrogen on a technology neutral basis. A carbon intensity framework can include a threshold and it can also include a certification scheme to rigorously account for greenhouse gas emissions arising both at the site of production and upstream of production. While the different ways to um, refer to hydrogen, for example, clean, green, renewable, aren't necessarily interchangeable, it is helpful to understand how different states or countries have defined each of these terms to inform the development of a Connecticut-specific definition. <clears throat> 
Prior to US federal guidance on defining clean hydrogen, three US states actually passed legislation to define clean, green, or renewable hydrogen, and several more, such as California and New York, did actually propose a definition in legislation, but this didn't end up getting passed. Notably, as you can see on this table, many definitions that we've seen across the country and internationally are technology agnostic, meaning that they don't specify necessarily what feedstock may be used for production, which this does have the potential to enable diverse market development. Although we can see specifically relating to definitions of green hydrogen, there are a few definitions that enable only electrolysis with renewables to apply. Additionally, many definitions we're seeing here explicitly excluded the use of fossil fuels. Finally, an increasing number of definitions, as we've all discussed, notably the US federal definition, rely on a carbon intensity threshold to define clean hydrogen. And I believe I see a hand up from Julia and Aziz. I'm not sure if that's a legacy hand, but Julia, I'll let you go up. Hi, Jennifer. Thank you so much. This is really helpful. Just yeah. you might not know the answer, but just curious in the places that have proposed definitions and then they didn't end up passing. Mm -hmm. Do we know what kind of opposition they were receiving? That's a great question. I don't know that off the top of my head, but I'm very happy to get back to you on that one. Um, I okay. think specifically in California, there was feeling that they weren't quite ready to define um, green hydrogen when that legislation came up. Um, I believe it came up over a year ago, so it was very early in the game, but gotcha. I can look into New York or other states if you are interested. Yeah, just thinking about like what kind, if there's particular groups of opposition or arguments that are made elsewhere Absolutely. that we might want to just um, account for and consider in any type of um, proposals we make if we do. Absolutely, that's a great point. Okay. Moving forward, just in summary, we've seen to date that three U.S. states, Oregon, Washington, and Montana, have defined clean hydrogen in statute outside of the federal definition. Varying approaches have been taken within these states for defining hydrogen based on a region's climate goals, technology development activities, and geographic considerations. But overall, aligning a state's definition with federal guidance is important for access to federal funding opportunities. To clarify, based on federal guidance, clean hydrogen is hydrogen that's produced through a process that results in life cycle emissions of a rate not greater than four kilograms with less than two kilograms of carbon dioxide emitted at the point of production. And I see a hand from Sip Shannon. Yeah, thank you. I have a question um, about alignment with the federal guidance. Mm -hmm. So um, would it be necessary that a state's definition um, be like identical to the federal guidance or is that more like um, a floor, like, like a state could have a more stringent definition and that would still be considered consistent with the federal guidance? Absolutely. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, that's absolutely a floor. So that is you know, at the least, that should be what a state is achieving. But of course, there's always room for a more stringent definition. I think Brian, uh, Brian, Brian, do you have yeah. something to add on that? Sure. Hi, guys. This is Brian Farner from the Green Bank. And, and let's remember, these are going to be tough topics, right? And like we're part of a working group and, you know, we may have inter industries say, hey, we want to go this route. We may have an environmentalist, you know, group or groups say, you know, we really want to take more of a approach in this way and it's okay on certain points if we say hey a consensus was not reached because of x y and z and we can set those forth and you know and then at some point there may be a few items where you don't have a consensus at the working group level and maybe the whole task force does it but at the end of the day that's what we could potentially report out so i i mean i don't want us to get so um caught up on like it's a very important issue on you know how do we define um, hydrogen, clean hydrogen, color, no color, like, but at the end of the day, we don't want that to, uh, you know, prohibit a lot of the great work we're going to do. So, you know, at the end of the day, there may be a few items where 
we don't get a consensus, but we need to make sure that we could obviously try to find as much consensus as possible. So just trying to like level set it for everyone and now I'll shut up probably for the rest of the meeting. <laughs> You're welcome to speak again during the meeting. I just want to um, agree with what Brian's saying. It's just at this point, it's very important to have this forum just to get perspectives on the table and for everyone to understand where all groups are coming from in this. Um, go ahead, Joe. I was just going to quickly follow up to that and say, you know, we do have the sources working group too that is also uh, looking at uh, definition too. So uh, it's important that we start to have these conversations um, in this working group as well because, uh, you know, policy certainly plays a role in that in that definition. So uh, we do have a couple additional hand raises. Um, I think it was Shannon first, so you can go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Just a quick follow up to Brian's point. Um, is the intention that the final report uh, to be finalized in January will indicate where there are, for example, points of disagreement and like which members of the task force have expressed various positions? I'm not sure if that's been um, explained yet. That's a great question. Yeah, I do not think that has been explained yet, but I think for points that there is an agreement on, it's very important to include in the legislative report. Um, what different parties um, perspectives are just so that the legislature is aware of yeah. what all these conversations are. But um, Shannon, I welcome your perspective on that as well. Yeah, I absolutely think that um, the report should indicate where there is consensus and where there's disagreement. Brian or Sarah, did you have any uh, follow up to that from Sarah or from Shannon? I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to add, and it's up to the task force at the end of the day, how you want to present that with that component, you know, it's, it's up to the task force to decide. But I do think that is the right type of approach is, you know, here's where certain members or groups, you know, we could figure out how broad, how specific we want to get. We can come to that kind of as a team and as a task force and kind of make that determination. Yeah, just echoing what's been said, you know, um, we, we are certainly looking for the, to us, the most important element of this is presenting the robust stakeholder process that occurred. And if that resulted in, you know, dissension among the ranks around certain topics, we want to make sure that that's included in the report as well. So, yeah, as we get towards the report writing time, um, we'll make sure that you all are engaged, especially where there are points of contention to make sure that we're accurately representing the, the diversity of opinions. And I think Julia, uh, you had your hand raised as well, so I want to give you the opportunity to speak here. Yeah, I'm actually going back to the original topic about the the baseline of the federal guidance question, just because I was thinking about that some more. Sorry yep. to jump topics again, but no, it's because it's guidance and not a standard, I don't think that we have to worry about federal preemption in this situation. So we can essentially, I think, I mean, obviously, we the, the goal is to create alignment and the ability to coordinate with other states and things, but. Um, in this situation, it's not like a, you know, a federal um, appliance efficiency standard, which would pre preempt a, a state's ability to set a more strict, um, a, a different standard. So um, I just wanted to um, point that out, I think. Absolutely. That's very helpful. Um, clear guy, Julia. Okay, I think in the interest of time to give Time to our wonderful workforce development participants. I'll quickly go through this final slide. I just want to note that uh, Argonne National Labs has done a study with the GREAT model just to figure out what the life cycle emissions of different hydrogen production sources are. So you can see that a diversity of feedstocks currently are allowable under the clean hydrogen production standard. So if Connecticut is interested in a more stringent definition, um, this data can definitely help inform what feedstocks will be applicable. But thank you so much for your wonderful engagement on this topic. I'm going to hand it over to Joe to move into the workforce development section. Yeah, thanks so much, Jen. And uh, yeah, thank you again to all of you for the helpful feedback on this. This is uh, some good discussion here. Uh, and so, you know, this is the policy and workforce development working group. And I think, you know, thus far we've talked a lot about policy, certainly the last meeting in this the first half of this one. So we do want to get the conversation started on workforce development um, and introduce some different perspectives here too. Um, so we are fortunate uh, today to be joined by Keith Brothers and Joe Toner, uh, as well as uh, Aziz Dekan. So 
Um, I just want to thank you all again for joining us and uh, we'd like to have each of you sort of spend a few minutes introducing yourselves and talking a bit about you know, the role that you've played or you will play and do play uh, in workforce development and uh, some key insights related to clean hydrogen, perhaps. Um, and then we'll move uh, to some discussion questions. Um, Keith, maybe we'll start with with you and Joe. Yeah, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. So as I mentioned earlier, the building trades is 30,000 construction workers across the state, and we like to hold ourselves in a, a high threshold and esteem when it comes to training. Our Most of our international unions are over a century old, so we've been training members and and workers for over a century throughout the different building trades unions. So when a, an opportunity like this comes up with a different energy source, or a different workforce, uh, you know, we take pride in training the members and creating a curriculum that will make everybody that does that type of work successful. Uh, the other important thing for us is that the jobs that we create in this workforce, they stay in Connecticut, they're residents of Connecticut. Um, I was appointed to this task force uh, by Senator Bob Duff, who is a proponent and a, a great supporter of project labor agreements and things we do across the state. So that is what ensures that the people we train are people from Connecticut, live in Connecticut, spend their paychecks in Connecticut. Um, Joe's going to talk uh, briefly uh, about the BTTI, the Building Training, Training Institute. We recruit men and women from across the state, from inner cities, veterans. We really stretch out and do things that uh, the Par Department of Corrections, we have programs with. We create opportunities for people that are life changing. We put people in positions, men and women, that change their lives and create careers. That's what we do in the building trades. Um, so that's a brief uh, synopsis of what the building trades does and what I do as the president of the building trades and I'll hand it over to Joe. Hi, so, I, I, so I'm the executive director of the building trades. I'm formerly, I'm an iron worker by trade. I, I've been an iron worker for over 35 years. Um, relatively, I'm relatively new to this position, the building trades um, did not have an executive director, and I've been with the building trades exclusively for over a year and a half now. And during that time, um, we've actually worked closely with Aziz and their folks, making sure that there's the transition for our people in the building trades from fossil fuels to renewables is, is a just transition where we're included on the projects. Um, during that time, we actually, as Keith mentioned, we do a lot of training with our own JTCs. So our apprenticeship pr training programs are funded by our members exclusively by our members, right? And 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 we've been doing that to the tune of over $30 million a year in the state of Connecticut. So each individual local union has their own apprenticeship program that specializes in that type of work that the trade specializes in. So what we decided in the building trades is we want to make sure that we're getting out to everybody across the state of Connecticut and giving them an opportunity to get into the building trades. So we created the Building Trades Training Institute. The Building Trades Training Institute is a feeder program for the apprentice programs and making sure folks from disadvantaged communities, non-traditional folks are getting into the building trades and 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 we we expand that through the state of Connecticut. So in Hartford, we had a program called the Hartford Jobs Funnel for many years. It was very successful. The Hartford Jobs Funnel was part of Adrian's Landing legislation in, in early 2000. And in Hartford, what we were able to do is we were able to put 1,200 Hartford residents into the unionized construction industry. And many of these folks have 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 some past, right? They have a record. Um, we were able to get in and help these folks figure out a way how we could bring these folks academically up to compete with folks from outside of Hartford, right? The, the, unfortunately, they weren't afforded the same educational opportunity we realized. So we would get in there, we would work with these folks, we'd get them in, and then we would enroll them in, into the different apprenticeship program. So for, from the success from the Hartford Jobs Funnel, we decided we're gonna take that statewide. So fortunately, we were able to get a grant for $3.6 million from OWS, the Office of Workforce Strategy in Connecticut, to deliver this system state ride. Currently, we're in eight different municipalities. So our the motto for the uh, Connecticut State Building Trades Training Institute is, is, is recruit, train, and retain. 
So it's truly what we do. So we get into the neighborhoods. We have staff that gets into the neighborhoods. We work with other community groups. And what we'll do is we'll go in, we'll recruit these folks. Typically, we bring them in for a 40 hour, a 40 hour uh, construction awareness program, which provides OSHA 10s and some of the simplest types of you know um, credentials. So these folks can be enrolled right into the jobs from their communities, right? That's so. We, and then at that point, once we take these classes in and we give them th that 40 hour credential week, at that point, we have the, all of the apprentice coordinators come in. They do an industry awareness port, part with them where they teach their specific trades, the group that graduated, and then we enroll the folks. So right now, as we speak tomorrow, we're right now up with the Laborers Academy up in Poffer and Keith is a laborer. They have the Taj Mahal of all Taj Mahals with training. They have a, a facility in Poffer that is second to none. I, I don't think it could match it anywhere in the country, probably other labor laborers, the facilities would match it, but for the building trades, it's our Taj Mahal. So we we recruited a class from Torrington. We have 10 folks in Torrington right now. Um, you know, probably some unemployed, underemployed, right? Um, the majority of the folks in this cohort that we have up in Pomfort are, are minority. Um, we kept them up in Pomfort for the week. We keep them overnight, we feed them, and we train them exclusively for 40 hours. So we're excited tomorrow that we're going to complete that that 40 hour training tomorrow up in Pomfret. And then what we're going to do is we're going to enroll them into the apprenticeship programs out in Torrington. Um, we have a project labor agreement and Torrington High School Middle School project. And those folks are going to go right from the community right onto that job site. So it's second to none. We're recycling tax dollars or we're making sure we're bringing everybody up to work on these projects. And one of the beauties of, of that, to, the, the way we're, we do this is some of the folks, we know transportation is a little bit of an issue for the disadvantaged community. And this actually helps them getting back and forth, get a couple paychecks in their wallet, and that'll help them get to the point of where the transportation needs are a little bit more accessible. So that's that's a great, great thing that we're doing as far as, and that's in right now, like I mentioned earlier, we're in eight communities and we're expanding. Um, on, the, on the renewable side, we're going to be in New London soon. We're working with the folks with Orsted. And unfortunately, Avon Grid is trying to export our jobs on the wind energy in Bridgeport. So that's a little bit of a problem right now. But we had a proposal to work with Avon Grid in Bridgeport. But I think they, they're finding it more necessary to uh, construct the, the, the wind stuff in Denmark than Connecticut. So that's a little bit of an issue. I mean, it's secondary to what we're doing here today. But, but we want to make sure not only you know with our local unions but to the BTTI that we are part of this solution. One of the things I will say on, on, on the transition from fossil fuels to renewables, two things I'll say is, is our plumbers and pipe fitters, which would, would benefit greatly from the hydrogen work, right? Um, you know, the fossil fuel projects that, 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 are, aren't, that are being eliminated for our folks, that's a huge impact on the plumbers and pipe fitters. The plumbers and pipe fitters in Connecticut is, is one of our largest local unions. Their training is second to none, and, and they're looking forward to the transition. But the, the, the one of the locals, one of our internationals that's really, really affected is the Boilermaker. The Boilermaker is, is on, on the, I mean, they're, they're exclusive to fossil fuels, you know, I mean, I, I mean on, 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 their, on, on their scope of work. So making sure on this hydrogen side, I know there's been talk, I know it's separate from this, but about the digesters and stuff like that, that's actually going to help save our, our brothers and sisters in the Boilermakers Union because that transition is, is much needed. And, and as far as the skills go for this renewable work, I mean, we're there. Our internationals are training our, our folks, you know, for the transition. And, and we're quite frankly, we're, there's no one that can compete with us on the training side and the producti productivity side in, in the unionized construction industry. So that's kind of an overall, you know, I don't want to take too much time, but I, I'll take any questions on the BTTI. But the BTTI really, our mission is to make sure we're enabling folks that traditionally can't get into the building trades, right? There's small barriers. Um, we're making sure that they're having an opportunity to get in. We have money through our grant spelled out for daycare for, for, for single mothers or single fathers or fathers and mothers that are having some issues with daycare. We have stipends for there, and we also have stipends for transportation. So 
Uh, one of the things that we're also doing in, in, in some of the disadvantaged communities is we're making sure we have staff work with these young folks and help them with their learning per their, their learning permits for their driving. Right. I mean, those little things you, you'd be amazed, but uh, these little barriers that we traditionally have done for over the last 20 years, you know, starting at the Hartford Job Funnel now to the BTTI, actually create create opportunities for these folks that would never had them before. You know, what I mean, when you don't. You know, there's no bus line on a construction site, unfortunately, right? And 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 then ultimately, these folks have to go to our apprentice schools, which probably aren't in the same town where they live in, typically, right? So that's what we're doing in the BTTI. We're looking forward to working with everybody in the renewable side, and, and we're excited uh, to be part of this uh, of this group. So thank you, Joe. Thanks, though. Yeah, thank you so much, Joe, uh, Keith, and Joe, and. Um, uh, thanks for all the great work you're doing there, and I think you anticipated some of the issues I, I have for the uh, discussion questions in just a little bit, so uh, well done there, but uh, I hope we can dig into some of those things too. So uh, I want to give uh, Aziz a chance too um, to kind of speak to, you know, what your role has been and, and your thoughts on this. Yeah, thank you. Joe, you covered just about everything that I, I wanted to have said. Um, Look, uh, the Connecticut Roundtable on Climate and Jobs uh, works very closely with the uh, Connecticut State Building Trades. Um, Joe and I sometimes are on the phone more often than I'm on the phone with my wife. So, you know, we, we talk quite a bit and we try to make sure that we're aligned in some of the work that we're doing, right? We don't always agree, but we find pathways to agree. Um, and I, I've told people many times that if you're not certain, um, if you don't believe what Joe just told you, uh, I'll take you up to Pomfret um, and, and I'll show you exactly what's going on up there. Because when I went up, I was actually blown away. Um, um, these are not empty words that Joe and Keith are talking about. Um, these are people who have, have now access to uh, jobs, have access um, that are from marginalized communities. Look, and the other part is transportation is a huge issue for the round table and we're looking for different solutions. Uh, we're working with the trades on this as well. Um, you know, our concern has always been uh, project labor agreements, prevailing wage, and we want to make sure that, you know, the just transition is just that, um, that, you know, and it's, and it moves from fossil fuels to renewables, and we have to keep pushing. Um, I won't spend any more time other than to say that when Joe says that, you know, about Bridgeport, um, Bridgeport is a benchmark right now. If, if, if they can, if they can break an agreement that brings jobs and keeps jobs in Connecticut, then we're all lost. It's not just about renewable jobs then, it's about every kind of job. And so, you know, this, this is for, for us and for myself personally, this is, this is a line in the sand that we cannot let happen. And we wanna make sure that as we move in this, in this task force group, um, that we make sure that any agreements that are put into place are held into place and find way, mechanisms that, um, don't let developers work their way out of it. You know, um, it, it's it's not right. It, it, and and it's you know, if if the jobs are going to go to let's say Massachusetts, that's no that's no good. That you know, this this is a Connecticut issue, and we want to make sure that anything that we do within this group, um, we work side by side with the building trades with industry as much as possible and to make sure that the goals that Joe just outlined are absolutely met and, and codified in one way or another. Yeah, thanks so much Aziz. Um, so why don't we, Jennifer, if you can pull up the discussion questions too, and I do want to call out a comment from Shannon um, here. Uh, the comment was, I just want to read it a lot for everyone. Uh, very interesting to hear about these workforce development programs. Uh, and Shannon asked uh, if you have links you could share uh, so we can all learn more. Um, Keith and Joe and Aziz, I'm sure you have plenty of links to share. So um, uh, you're welcome to drop them in the chat or you can email uh, myself or Jennifer or any of the Green Bank folks and we'll make sure that we disperse those uh, to this working group and folks uh, who are participating in this call today. But uh, I think I would echo that. I think uh, any additional resources on this uh, would be a great benefit. So uh, thank you all. Uh, and so, you know, I think we have about 10 minutes left here. Um, and so I do want to take some time talking through some of these issues. Um, you know, I know we touched on a few of these already, but uh, to the extent that we have further thoughts um, in, on some of the questions that, you know, we do want to start talking about or addressing in this working group. Um, and the first one here is, 
you know, how's the development of clean hydrogen in Connecticut expected to impact workforce needs? And, you know, I think closer to related to that, this has been touched on a little, is how will it impact the existing energy workforce in general? Um, so any thoughts that, you know, Keith, Joe, or Aziz that you can share on that or any of our other uh, stakeholders as well on this call? Well, I think that's all about training. I think if you, you know, when I when I meet with leadership and, you know, the governor's always asking, are we going to have enough people? Are we going to have enough training? Um, that's why we do what we do with the outreach. You know, when, when Joe and Aziz said, these are, you know, they're real jobs. They're, they're jobs that are careers for people. So, um, you know, the development of the hydrogen market expected impact, it's, it's going to affect us from, you know, the building trades is, that's what we do. We build things. So the more jobs, our folks build ourselves out of jobs every day they go to work. So the more jobs we have ahead of us, not behind us, is really what the uh, benchmark is for the building trades. And as far as training goes, like I had said in my opening comments, we've been doing it for a century, all of all the trades in this banner behind me. So um, we're up for the task. You know, the more the, the more jobs, the better and, and the needs will be fulfilled. And we're looking forward to anything and everything that's coming our way. Hi, this is uh, Sridhar Kanuri from Hiaxia. I just wanted to make a comment. So, so with regards to the trades and and the workforce development in Connecticut, uh, one thing that we can get ahead of the rest of the country is is maybe creating a program on electrochemical technologies, um, because fuel cells, electrolyzers, things that use and make hydrogen, uh, have this electrochemical technology in common. We, we see automotive trades, we see trades in electrical, we see trades in other areas uh, like nursing, but I have not come across this particular kind of program anywhere. And if that is available and we can create a workforce with that kind of skill set, uh, licenses and safety related to electrochemical technologies and understanding of the electrochemical technologies, I think it can really spur the hydrogen economy in the state. So, so that's 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 a comment. Now, uh, excellent point here. I think it touches on. Uh, we had some very early discussions on. I think in the first task force meeting about uh, you know technical skill sets too. Um, I think this is this all aligns together, right? So, um, and you know this that gets into this issue of our second question here. You know what types of skills will be needed and. You know, particularly, I'm I'm interested, Joe. I know you touched on this a little bit with the the piping, but you know, where are there complementary skill sets uh, that are already existing and they're are ripe for, you know, some slight retraining or you know, uh, repurposing? Uh, and where is there really a lack for that, and where we'll need to do uh, heavier heavier retraining or upscaling or recruiting even? Um, so, um, any other thoughts that that folks have on that? I, I could I could say one thing, and I'll use a football analogy. It's probably the easiest way to figure out this this question. So, this is as easy as going from left guard to right guard on a football team, right? I mean, so the the, the fitters and 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 they're already trained across the board, and our folks are already trained across the board. It's just a matter of it, it, this is not a new process. You know what I mean? I mean, it, I mean, it, it's going to be a new, it'll be a new process. But as far as the training goes. It's something that's trained day in and day out with the plumbers and pipe fitters and, and, and the boilermakers. So I think on, on that side of it, I mean, you know, on the fuel cell side of it, we, we're already the electricians and the fitters are already on the fuel cell side doing that work, you know, in Connecticut. And, 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 and you know, with the SB 999 language, um, you know, making sure it's prevailing wage, it's making, it's providing more of an opportunity for our folks. But I think as far as that goes with, with with the skills. I think the skills are there. It's just a matter of plugging in what they need, a little bit more specific on on that type of work. But but just by the nature of the work that they do, they're trained in that work. Aziz, any any additional comments or thoughts? Okay. Uh, so the other thing I'm curious about here, I know that uh, Joe, you spoke extensively about some of the types of training programs that that you have here, but. Uh, I'd like to ask on any, you know, what what other challenges do we see here, or anticipate here with this, um, and along with that too is the challenge of how to ensure equity 
in what we're doing um, in just transition. So uh, if any of you can speak to more of that um, or have any other thoughts on what you think the biggest challenges will be uh, with this transition. Is it, do you want me to take that or keep, you know, I mean, yeah. so I, 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 to be honest with you, I mean, I, I and when we mentioned Bridgeport a few times, I mean, but I think, I think that's the importance and Aziz touched on it also. We have to make sure, listen, I, I, I'll say this from a building trades perspective, you know, and, and some of the folks on, 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 you know, on, on this today that we're meeting with, I mean, we, we've been in different corners when it comes to putting our people to work, right? We, we, we've been, you know, on the fossil fuel side. I mean, we, we really haven't had any opportunity in the last five years in Connecticut and our folks are, 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 are sitting behind and, and they're not working, right? And, and, and listen, we understand global warming. We're not ignorant to it, you know, we're, but also we have to make sure that we are part of this just transition and it's not happening. I, I, it's not happening on the wind side so far in Bridgeport. So what's happening is everyone was, you know, and, and, and we have great language. In, in, in the bill on the wind side. So I think coming out of this this working group, I, I think, you know, we have to mandate, you know, uh, we feel in the building trades that we have to mandate that this work has to be done with project labor agreements, making sure the community is involved. And, 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 and we could write these stipulations into the agreements. We could put the percentages in the agreements. We could include the, the building trades training institute into the agreement. We could also make sure we're incorporating folks that were incarcerated that, that are coming home are going to have a career in the building trades. We have that relationship, right? So I think a lot of this stuff, I mean, listen, we're, we're willing to work with anybody, but but we have to make sure that everyone on the other side kind of holds a line to these developers. These developers are, are, are getting good tax credits in many cases, right? The renewable energy, the, the, the price for the renewable energy is, is a fixed price, right? I mean, so they're so they're making a fixed price, and then what happens is once the developments come in, it, it, they, they forget about us, and, and and we're stuck. And unfortunately, for the last five years, our folks have been sitting home because the, the fossil fuel projects have been getting killed. So so I, I I hope at some point, you know, we could all realize that 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 we these are jobs that should be going to Connecticut residents and paying a livable wage and we'll compete with anybody as long as that's done right i mean but the, the developers come in and 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 they don't seem to live up to their end of the bargain so that's where that's where we need as much help as, as possible and and what i always learned from joe toner was um the three words a level playing field and i think that's really important to recognize um, as we move from fossil fuel jobs into renewables and and one last piece too is so that if you know if we have a target range and i'll just throw it out uh, because we did it on um, uh, large renewable projects you know two megawatts we can't have a developer coming in and doing two projects that are one megawatt each you know because we know what that means and we know what they're trying to do so we had you know i get it uh, but i don't want to get it and we want to make sure that that you know we hold we hold everybody ourselves included accountable so I know we just have a couple minutes left here. I do want to squeeze in a question and I'm going to make it a compound question because um, I tend to do that. But, you know, what, what can the role of government be in this? And also along with that or in parallel, what's the role for the community as well? And what, uh, how do we ensure that there's community involvement? So uh, I'll, I'll open that up to go ahead, Aziz. I'm going to dive in first. I think I think we, we haven't touched on community benefit agreements. And you know we we see it in so many other marginalized communities where they put power plants and 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 whatever, and that can't happen. We need community benefit agreements that are that are solid and and enforceable. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it there and let let Joe go on the other end of that. Well, I, I think I think part of it is 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 you know when the RFPs come out and and we 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 work. Good pretty close with Commissioner Dykes, right? I mean, so when the RFPs come out, we have to make sure that 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 these provisions are upheld. Also, if, if in some of this work, there might be P3s, there might be public-private partnerships, right? On these public-private partnerships, we have to make sure when these folks come into town that they're meeting with the right people and, and, and people are being included. We can't, you know, a lot of developers, I know on the wind side, a lot of our European, they're not local developers. And there's no relationship and there's no trust there. There's not. And 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 ultimately, what the, on the wind side, what they're trying to do is they want to bring their workforce in from Europe, right? I mean, and we want to make sure we put our people to work. And and a, we we want the clean energy, but we want to be part of the the, the situation, uh, part of the, the the scenario. So, 
I, I think, you know, as far as the training with the government goes, you know, other than the BTTI, where we did have a grant from the OWS from the state of Connecticut, it's, it's ARPA money, actually. Um, it's federal money. I, I think other than that, we're willing to do all the training exclusively in kind like we do every day, right? As, as Keith mentioned earlier, we've been training for 100 years. I mean, I, we spend 30, over $30 million a year. So give us the curriculum, give us the certificates that are needed in the industry. We'll train our own at our own facilities to, to meet the demand, right? I mean, I, I think I think part of the government money or the state money on the BTTI side helps because that, that gets people out on the streets to make sure that they're getting into these programs. So I, I hope that answers that part of it. I think if you look at a, an industry like the submarine industry in Groton, right? There's three stakeholders there when we do things in Groton. We, we're building a billion dollar shipyard assembly building for the new class of submarines so the stakeholders of the community and the building trades you've got government and then you've got the owner which is general dynamics so together and collectively you know everybody on that everybody in that facility is is part they have skin in the game to aziz's point i mean the communities involved at electric boat pratt and whitney all these successes we have across the state we need to bring those success stories into this new realm of work and workforce development for this new hydrogen uh, work that's coming our way. So have we done it before in that? No, but can we do it? Yes. So that's the models there. We just need to plug in the different players and, and get it done the right way. Yeah, thank you all for that. Um, and that's probably, I, I wish we had more time. Uh, that's a nice note to end on with this discussion, but I think this is really you know, I look forward to next steps in these discussions uh, as we continue this conversation. There's 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 so much to talk about here. So um, I just want to quickly, I know we are a little bit over time here, just want to quickly flag next steps as far as work, working group meetings coming up. Uh, Jennifer mentioned the funding working group. Uh, they'll be meeting next week on the 27th. I'm sorry, on the 26th. I was looking at September. <laughs> uh, we also have meetings with the infrastructure uh, and sources and uses working groups are occurring next week. Also, our next meeting for the policy and workforce development working group uh, will be on uh, uh, November 29th uh, at this same time. So uh, we look forward to uh, developing the agenda for that and engaging in more great discussion on this. Uh, so uh, I want to thank you all for your time and, and thank our, our speakers here uh, for their participation and uh, their engagement with this working group. Um, I really do appreciate it. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, and one other thing too, uh, just for the record, want to call out from the, the chat as for future discussion, uh, Shannon did bring up um, how regional hub proposal, um, you know, how might that address workforce development and whether Connecticut is engaged um, in discussions on this issue with neighboring states. Uh, I think that is something to flag for future discussion. So I appreciate you bringing up that point. Um, uh, I know we're a little bit over time, but I want to invite folks if they have a, another quick minute for anything for the good of the order. Uh, if not, we'll go ahead and close out. Great. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you joining today. I think this is a great discussion and I look forward to more of this. So thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.